everyone. Thanks. Uh, thanks. I'm, I'm sorry not to be there uh, with you in Helsinki, and I'm delighted to be part of the panel. I'm looking forward to the conversation. I'm going to be presenting um, some work that draws on uh, my 2020 book, How Insurgency Begins, as well as a newer working paper uh, that builds on it uh, with co author Stephen Ringazis. And the research question that I want to focus on today. Uh, it's a secondary question to the book and, and the central one for the paper is why and how do rebel groups, right, non-state armed anti-state actors use violence during the initial stages of their group formation before they become a substantial threat to the state they seek to challenge? And before I provide an answer, uh, it's worth pausing to ask why, why do I think we don't already know this? I already have an expansive, large you know, literature on conflict onset, <clears throat> but it in fact focuses very little on conflict start, especially in the highly weak state contexts that are at the center of the book and the paper uh, that I'm presenting here. And, and what I mean is that most studies, at least in the social sciences, examine the correlates of conflict onset usually defined as a threshold of violence. Right, usually 25 recorded um, battle-related deaths. Um, and, and most leading theories of conflict onset take for granted the existence of an already formed organization. Right, something that looks like this. This is the resistance army in Uganda, one of the cases I studied for the book. Right? And so they're insurgents. They don't have fancy uniforms or sort of heavy conventional uh, military equipment, but they're a sizable organized group. Right? But of course, there's an earlier phase Right, a period when people initially begin, uh, you know, come together to begin conspiring and committing violence against the state. A period when rebellion may look something more like this: right? a small group um, who are, you know, clandestine, um, still building an organization, and while they may be uh, starting to commit violent acts, right? they haven't gained substantial coercive capacity or organizational capacity. Right, and so. Using fieldwork throughout several regions of Uganda um, for the book, I retrace uh, groups in this earlier phase and contrast it to after they become um, viable groups and, and ask why, um, <clears throat> why only some make it to, to viability. You know, <clears throat> why don't scholars usually study these initial phases? And the answer is pretty simple. It's really hard to do so um, systematically due to lack of evidence. Right? Nas nascent rebels are often clandestine, um, they often form in very remote areas of um, low capacity states where, where journalists are only minimally present, if at all. And so the, the early phases leave just kind of a faint imprint on news media or um, even the historical record sometimes. And so um, I'm gonna argue today, um, even, even beyond this, um, that the rebel groups also often in the initial phases uh, commit violence in a way that makes them difficult to distinguish um, from criminal groups. Okay, which exacerbates these problems of, of making it hard to detect them and, and count them early on. Okay, and the consequences of this is that we have sort of an omission of small conflicts in our body of knowledge, I think, um, and, and of systematic evidence about the very initial phases even of those that go on to become large conflicts. And uh, so my evidence for this is I, I collected um, what I thought was all conflict uh, onset articles since 2013 sort of major conflict in political science journals and found that 78% uh, of them rely on one of four data sets. Um, so the data sets have obviously been an incredible public good for, for those who study conflict, but they happen to, they intentionally omit um, rebels that, that fail early, those that don't cross thresholds of at least um, 25 battle related deaths, right? So, so it's an intentional, but, but this leads, um, I argue, and I'm gonna present some evidence today that supports this, that it, it leads to really substantial omissions. And you may reasonably wonder like, well, you know, who cares if we, if we miss out on, on small conflicts, right? Of course, it's a large scale violence um, that we should be most focused uh, on stopping. But, but of course there are, you know, small conflicts can cause really grave humanitarian issues. Um, for the people who are affected by them. Um, <clears throat> um, but it also means from sort of an inference standpoint, that's very easy to, um, because of issues of selection problems in the data confuse the cause causes and processes about the start of conflict um, with those of its escalation. And sort of more simply, it means that we might just sort of mischaracterize what's going on uh, at the start of armed conflict, 
right, and, and why they erupt. And I'm going to argue actually today that this common characterization of conflict erupting doesn't really capture what's going on at the start of conflict um, for a large portion of armed conflicts, that they often simmer first at a, at a very low level. Okay, so this is, this is important to um, understand, um, you know, to get a clear picture of how conflicts begin, both for our theoretical micro foundations and for thinking about how one could intervene effectively before conflict uh, does escalate. Okay, so what I'm trying to do here today and in this broader project is to bring into focus these early stages of rebellion that have largely remained obscure. <clears throat> so why and how do nascent rebels use violence? Um, core part of my argument, I mean, and recall this, is, this, this project is focused on very low capacity states. Um, those with a minimal presence to um, detect emergent threats in their peripheral territories. Okay, so that's a key scope argument of what I'm gonna argue here. And I argue that in those contexts, barriers to entry for rebels are low, right? Where, where states have trouble detecting emergent threats, um, rebels can and do start poor, right? Without substantial material resources or substantial weaponry, um, weak from a military standpoint, and, and therefore vulnerable defeat. Like not, not all will, Right, but the modal group, it should, be most, it should be common for this to happen where barriers to entry are, are low, which they should be in, in low capacity states. And therefore, right, if states, right, even if they're weak states, but if they receive accurate information about who the rebels are and where they are, even low capacity states should be able to end a poor, weak uh, rebellion. <clears throat> right? And this makes nascent rebels in these contexts really reliant, I argue, on civilian silence, right? If civilians inform the state, um, if, they, if they know that there's a rebellion forming, they know who and where they are, right? Then that can lead to the demise of the, the rebels in a very early stage, right? But this means that committing violence is really dangerous for rebels. It's a very public act, right? It's a very conspicuous act, right? So. So why do it, right? Why not just lay low until you're ready to go with a strong army and, and you're, you're no longer so vulnerable, right? And I argue that while it's dangerous, it can also be useful, right? If nascent rebels use violence carefully, right? If they're sure to um, attack targets that they think they can sort of successfully attack, right? Then they might gain arms, right? Even just attacking at night, couple of police officers and gaining their weapons can be really useful for these nascent rebel groups, right? They, they're poor, they need weapons. Um, <clears throat> at the same time, they wanna test and shape their operational environment, right? Early attacks can help them understand how quickly the state may be able to identify them, right? Back in, the, in these early phases, they may still be able to just give up and melt back into the population. They may also be able to shape the operational environment with sort of careful select targeted killings of those who they think may um, be likely to detect them and turn them into the state. Um, and this may importantly shape civilian beliefs about them, right? If they commit violence in a way and then, you know, sort of quietly whisper through the community that, you know, about how competent they are and how serious they are, right? They may demonstrate to civilians who are wondering, maybe perhaps seeing them or wondering about turning them into the state may convince them uh, to, it's not a good idea to share information with the state, right? But this, I argue, you know, this culminates into sort of key empirical explanations is that we should expect rebels to commit small scale attacks, right? They are weak, weak groups. And therefore, if they're going to be successful and gain arms, right and commit targeted killings right these are going to be small attacks in small number of people right carefully planned so probably infrequent or sporadic and we shouldn't expect like very large you know public declarations of of credit claiming right not the kind of not the kind of thing that would show up in the newspaper right there could again be whispers to trusted people who they think won't rot them out Right, but we wouldn't expect public proclamations of this. This was us in these early phases, right? But and and, and by, I should say actually, by the way, meanwhile, governments right don't usually have an incentive to declare this. There's a there's a rebellion here at least early on when they're still figuring out what's going on, right? And they're trying to convince civilians that anything going on should be um, shared with the state. Governments tend to have incentives to discredit new armed groups, 
right? And we see pretty frequently in qualitative um, accounts of early insurgency of governments calling them bandits, mere bandits. Right? And then this is going to change after groups become viable. We can talk about this more in the Q&A, but like groups with political aims are going to need to invest in military training and larger scale attacks if they're going to extract political concessions to the government. Right. So that's here's where they're going to diverge from what we would expect from most criminal, not all criminal groups. Right. That would have not have as uh, political aims tend to have more economic aims. OK, so we'd expect violence to grow in scale and frequency after groups uh, become viable. Right, and, and diverge from criminal groups. And I use uh, two, two uh, forms of evidence in the, in the paper, I should say. This, this builds on some, some case evidence where I, I trace out some of those ideas through case studies in Uganda using field work in the book. Um, but for the paper, I introduced um, a newer data set on rebel group formation in Africa. And the aim of the data set, I worked with undergrad uh, research assistants to try to, as close as possible, code all instances of rebel group formation in Africa from 1997 to 2015. And I can talk about this more in the q and I mean, we're, we're certain we um, fell short in, in, in capturing all groups because in several cases, we sort of saw traces. We were using a mix of you know, ACLED and GTD to first look at conflict events and try to figure out if we're identifying a group formation, other secondary sources, um, human rights organization sources, NGOs, right? But this is all work, you know, using the internet and libraries from the US. Um, there was no field work as part of this. And we, we, you know, saw traces of maybe there was a rebel group here, but we just couldn't um, pin it down, which, which demonstrates the importance of local, local sources. More on that in the conclusion. Um, we were able to capture 151 rebel groups in these countries. This is a map of the number of groups we captured in each country. We, 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 um, coded in each country during this period. Um, and only 33% of those groups that we counted were in these are commonly used um, conflict event data sets, the UCB Prio, the Uppsala Prio armed conflict data set, or the um, global terrorism data set. And right, so this, this evidence of, that the existing um, data sets are of, on armed groups are really missing um, quite a lot, at least in, in Africa, of armed group formations. Right, and it's worth noting just with basic regression analyses, that not surprisingly, right, groups that committed larger scale violence, right, at least an, an attack, a single attack that resulted in at least 25 battle related deaths, that sort of high conspicuous types of violence is highly correlated with inclusion in those data sets, right? So this is just more evidence that it's sort of the lower level groups um, that don't make it into the data sets. Right. <clears throat> and then among these groups, um, quite ask you interesting. To, sorry for interruption, uh, but may I ask you to uh, wrap up? Sure. Thank you. Great. Um, yeah, great. I'm almost there. Um, so only 18% of those 151 groups committed one of these substantial attacks in their first year. Right. And, and about a third only committed one of these substantial attacks in their first three years. Right. So again, we see that many groups, of, and I should say 40% of them went on to endure. So many sort of flame out quickly, but many go on and, and endure for quite some time, but still in their initial for a few years are only committing smaller scale um, violence. Okay, so um, limitations with the data um, preclude a lot of um, fancy analyses with them. So we turned to historical cases where there's actually really good evidence um, from uh, rebellions that are known for how large scale and political and ideological they were. We actually went back and retraced them. Resistance in Napoleonic Spain in the 19th century, um, Mao's CCP in Republican China, Vietnam in, in French Indochina, and we retraced them, um, you know, with a variety of historical sources. And, you know, it, it helps uh, to support the, the theoretical um, contentions that it was really difficult to distinguish these groups in their early phases from criminals, right? Again, even these groups that went on to become sort of iconic examples of political, ideological, large-scale rebellions. So I hope I've contributed here is some new theory and evidence on uh, early rebel violence that shows that rebel group formation is more common than we usually assume or count in our data sets. And this is just due to, to really um, severe measurement challenges that, that point to the importance of um, things like ACLED's uh, conflict observatories that make use not only of news media, but, but local sources. Um, <clears throat> and implications for conflict prevention in the state is that you know, early rebel violence 
is often small scale and ambiguous in nature, right? And it may even appear criminal. So we should we should be you know tracking criminal violence and really scrutinizing it with local sources if we're interested in understanding the early stages of armed conflict on set. Thanks a lot for your time.